Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, and thank you for having me. And I'm waiting for somebody to interpret for me, and I don't have to have an interpreter. So if I suddenly stop halfway through, it's because I'm waiting for somebody who's not there. And uh, normally it's past, and normally it's past to somebody that's standing alongside me. And so thank you for allowing me to be here, and thank you for allowing that, and for allowing me to, to come and uh, to this great church. I've been coming, I, I think, about 12 or 13 years. I'm not sure. I've, the older you get, the hey, Leah, how are you? <laughs> I can see you there. And I, um, I lose track of time the older you get. So uh, I became a grandfather this year. I got married when I was five, okay? So just if you're trying to work it out. And, um, but tonight I just want to share and, um, into something that I want to encourage you in, but equip you. I have started, this year we made, you guys are going for change. You know what? I think the whole world's going through change. It always is. I did one of the biggest changes of my life. I moved after 15 years leading a church that had grown and blessed here and been very successful. And we moved three and a half thousand kilometers and to a church that wasn't going so well and needed a big rebuild. Had been through lots of turmoil. And so God called us to fix things up. And, uh, and I, sorry if I keep seeing faces, I know. And so I sat there and I went, God. And it was actually this time, la- it was this time when I was last visiting here that I just received the invite and, uh, in the middle of last year. And, it, and 12 months ago tomorrow was when I left this town called Bansdale. So we've been through this change. And we've been through what I'm calling a rebuild. And I won't go into the details of the church that we are, have got, but we are in a, a community that is quite low socioeconomic. It has got many refugees from Africa and from Vietnam and from Middle East. And so it's a whole new world for us to enter this realm in the suburb of Perth called Girouin. But as I have been seeking God about what to do in our lives and in our church, in this rebuild, he gave me a scripture. He's taken me all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, which is a good place to go when you have to start again. And so I went back to the starting point and I felt God highlights something that uh, in my life and has become a series on rebuilding and, and, uh, and I'll read the scripture to you. The, I, I, this is some scripture I haven't given to the team, but let me read it to you. It's found in Genesis chapter one and Jesus, uh, God has said that, let, already said, let us make man in our image. So God made man and he made him in the image of God the Father, God the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he gave this command and he said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. God said, be fruitful, multiply and rule. God gave a commission to man which sin got in the way of But now that we have a redeemer, we go back to what God said to us. And he said to every single human, he said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. And I want you to take dominion and rule. And he said those three things because that's what God does. And we were made in the image of God. God is fruitful. God multiplies blessings and God rules over everything. And if you want to get to the place of rulership, it actually starts with knowing your identity, that I'm made in God's image, therefore I have authority from God, and that I am designed to be fruitful. I am created to be fruitful. And if I am fruitful, I will naturally multiply. And once I have multiplied, guess what? I am starting to rule by the sheer size of what I am multiplying. And so in this year of seeing a revelation there, God is really highlighting to me things like that there is a green light on my life. There is a green light on your life. He's already told you what you have to do. You actually don't have to keep stopping and asking him, what do I have to do? That's a ploy of the enemy. If he can get you to stop every five minutes and ask God, what do I do next? Then he has just slowed everything down. But he said right at the beginning, go out, be fruitful, multiply and rule your world. Now, as you enter Christmas, he's saying it again, go out, be fruitful, multiply and rule the world that you live in. Now, ruling is not dictatorship. Ruling is not being cruel. Ruling is having the authority to be an overcomer and victorious and have God's favor upon your life. And so as I've been doing this in my own life and discovering this, ruling, when I got to the area of rulership, I started to consider kings. 
And the children of Israel had kings, Israel and Judah. God gave kings and from Saul to Zedekiah. They had many kings at that time. They ruled uh, Saul to Zedekiah. Kings, and I start to think about kings. Kings get privileges and rights, but they also get responsibilities if they're going to rule. They have power, but they also have accountability. Kings lead and kings fight. Kings, they are providers and they are protectors. And God emphasized something as I started to look at a couple of incidences amongst the kings. I I discovered that kings are designed and created to fight. You are going to rule, but there is going to be a battle to rule. Because the enemy, the last thing he wants is for the church and the followers of Jesus Christ to take their full authority and to be who he called them to be. What were some of his last words? Here, you will do greater things than I have done. By the way, he didn't say you will become greater than me. Let that happen on its own. That's his story. We will do greater things by the power of the Holy Ghost. Not better, but we will be able to. Now, who is doing greater things? Therefore, if we're not doing the greater things, we haven't got to this place where we're fruitful, multiplying, and ruling again in our lives. And so as I unpack this, and thought about the kings. I thought about, you remember David and Goliath? And Goliath's calling out and saying, hey, where is your champion? Bring him out here. And the whole of Israel is scared. Who was their champion? Who was Israel's champion? Anyone know? It was their king, King Saul. He was the biggest of all of them. He was the champion of Israel, and he refused to fight the champion of the Philistines. And that's, that was the rise of David at that moment. His fame started that day and things happened. But years later, there's a scripture that says in the 2 Samuel 11, 1, in the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, David sent somebody else, Joab, and the Israel army to fight the Ammonites. The day when he should have been fighting, he's not fighting, and he fell and had a massive crash. Other kings, they made alliances with, uh, with other kings. And instead of fighting, they made deals and partnerships with the enemy of Israel and they suffered the consequences. So if we are called to rule, we are also called to lead and we're also called to fight. Kings must fight. So with that premise, that introduction, I want to highlight three things. Very quickly, two of them are very quick. The last one we're going to have some fun with because I want to leave you equipped on how you can fight maybe like you've never thought of before. So the first thing we need to understand is that we are all kings. In the old days, there were select people, but everybody is here who is following Jesus. It says in Revelations 1 to 5, uh, sorry, one chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, that to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. We have roles and rights as kings and as priests. We are called to build God's kingdom. We're anointed to rule our lives while we are on this earth. And for some of us, that's hard because the way we were raised, the last thing we had ever anyone ever said was that you have the power to be a king. But Jesus said, through my power, you have the power to be a king. And so we need to understand that if we want to get into the fight, that we are all kings and we better get our mind around that we have the right and the ability to fight. We have the right and the ability to lead. And the first area that you're going to fight is going to be in your mind. When Saul chose not to fight Goliath, It was a decision in his mind. When David chose not to go to war, it started with a decision in his mind. Every choice you make before you fight has to start with a battle in your mind. It was Eve's decision to listen and agree to the serpent that started the downfall in in her life and then in the life of mankind. No matter what attacks, temptations or stuff we face, the first battle is always in the mind. Decisions, temptations, speech, reactions starts in the mind. And David and Saul, they made decisions not to fight. They made decisions to sit back, maybe to relax, and maybe it's somebody else's turn. Maybe David is saying, oh, I'm old now. 
It's time not to fight. Let the young bucks do all the fighting. When you are a king, you are a king for life. And kings don't have choices about whether they fight or not. They are designed, created, chosen, appointed, and anointed to be fighters. That's what their call is. They can never stop fighting. And it was interesting that most of the enemies that David was going to fight would be the same ones he fought last year. Reoccurring enemies that we would need to continue to fight. And so we can't back off. If you remember the story of Jesus when he was tempted, at the end of, I think it's Matthew's version of the temptations, it says that Jesus left him, sorry, Satan left Jesus for a more opportune time. He was going to come back when Jesus was tired again. Maybe it was the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe it was some other area in his life. But he, there are enemies that we, and we all know what they are, will continue to fight to the day we die. They're going to reincur, so we cannot afford not to be ready. We have to get through ahead. That I'm not the kid that was raised in a slum. I'm not the child that I once was. I'm not the man I once was. I'm not the woman I once was. I am born again. I am a king of Jesus Christ. Anyone get that? Do you get that this evening? That you are a king. Okay. Only a few got that. If you are a woman, you can say queen. Okay. If you are a man, say king. If it's that way around, then you're in big trouble. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to hear from you right now. I want you all to say from the far corner to that corner that I am a king. I am a king. I am a king. I am a queen. I'm not saying that I'm a queen. I am a king. <laughs> Get it inside of you. And we could spend hours. To, what does that mean? It's something you could discuss in your family. What does it mean if we're kings and priests of God? You are a king and you must never stop fighting if you're going to keep reigning. That's what it's all about. Kings reign. And to keep their throne and kingdom, they need to fight from time to time. The second thing I want to talk about with a king is that the kings have the power through, they have their power through their authority. The success of their reigning is as strong as the authority that they carry. They can be this big. They could be a boy and they can still have authority to run an army. That is, it's not the size of them, but the power or the size of their authority. And as a king, you have authority to have victory, to overcome, to win, to rule in your life. Do you know that? Before you fight any battle, know that you have an authority. When Jesus said, I want you to be fruitful, sorry, when God said, I want you to be fruitful, to multiply and to rule, that tells me I have a green light. That tells me I can expect that there be fruitfulness, that there be multiplication, and that there be a rulership in my life. If we don't expect it, we will not live in it. Now, does that mean I won't have any problems? No. It means that I will fight to have that promise of fruitfulness, multiplication, and rulership in my life. So you have an authority. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 to 6, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What that means is that the Bible elsewhere, and we'll come to it in a few minutes, says that, we, that there are principalities and powers of darkness and authorities that rule the air. But when Jesus said that you are born again and seated in heavenly places, it means you have actually been seated above every spiritual power so that you may have authority through the one you sit next to, to rule over that principality. He, Satan's and his dominion are here while we are seated with Jesus. So we have to grasp that I am born again and I have an authority. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on servants and scorpions. In other words, you have an authority over the enemy's power. Whether you feel like it or not, in our country, I've noticed things are changing in Cambodia, but definitely in our country, the policemen 
goes to a training school for six months. He gets taught all the rules of his city and of the state. He, gets, he or she gets told how to handle a gun, how to handle a taser, how to handle handcuffs, how to turn someone and spin them around and put them on the ground, how to read their rights. And they get told and get trained on how to be a policeman or policewoman. And then one day, the same person that six months ago had entered the training center, one day they come to their graduation and they make a pledge to fulfill the laws of the land. And before the laws of the land, they make that vow. And from that day onwards, they have an authority to stop anybody. They can stand in front of a truck, a little lady, policewoman this big, and stand and go, stop in the name of my country. Just this little old girl has the power to stop and to arrest you. No matter what your size is, she can arrest you and take you to the locker. How does she do that when she does not have the power to stop me? Because she has the authority of the government backing her. This morning, this evening, when Jesus said you are seated in heavenly places, you have been given that authority, the right to speak to principalities and powers, to expect them to obey in the name of Jesus, not in your name, not in your good looks, not in your good deeds, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's through him when Peter reached down, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. The name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So you actually don't have to feel really good. I've actually been quite sick last night and this morning and today. So I, the last thing I really want to do is be preaching. It's my body's feeling like it wants to shake. But you know what? No matter what this body looks like, thank the Lord for that. It's not this body that has the authority to preach the gospel. It's the authority of God that gives me that right to preach the gospel. To expect signs and wonders to follow the preaching of the word. Tonight, if you need a miracle, God wants to perform a miracle. That's his desire. He's, that's, that was his very nature. He is healer. So we need better move on. So we have an authority. Kings need to know the authority so they can go boldly to battle, win, and not just fight. We've got to start to think like kings. And finally, it's where the rubber hits the road. Kings are armed. They have an armory. They have an army. They have armory. Uh, they, when Saul went to battle, when he, he tried to put on his own armor onto little David. And David said, that's not my armor, so I'm not wearing my armor. So kings in those days, they were the ones that had the armor, not everybody else necessarily, but they had. Ephesians 6 says this, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, use your authority. Understand you have power and authority. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. We have not only been given authority, as declared there, but we have now also been given weapons. Verse 13 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, springtime, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Now, I don't have a full set of armor for you tonight. But I do have an assistant somewhere with a sword and a shield. Come on down. Let's give him a big clap. Now, I, whoever arranged this for me, thank you very much. You did a great job. But let me just describe, let me describe. I want to show you something tonight. I hope you'll never forget. 
It was something God showed me in a prophetic time uh, and a few years back that happens to people from time to time. And I'm not going to go through all the armor of God. But if you think about the armor that was described, the helmet, salvation, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the belt of truth and the feet of the gospel, they are all personal defensive armor, purely to protect you from the enemy, to protect your faith, to protect your doubts, to protect you from your fears. Then at the end of that scripture, it describes the shield of faith. The shield of faith comes from, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. So we describe, and normally, let me just, normally a Roman's, you can say that for now. A Roman shield goes all the way down. It is designed to be locked in to someone alongside it. It's designed to be there protecting one another because it's more effective as a unit than it is as an individual. So I want you to picture this as a big square rectangle shield. And so we have, the Bible says we have a shield of faith. The shield of faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. We describe that as the Logos word, the general word of God, that whenever you read the word, it is feeding you. It's feeding your soul. That's why we encourage you, read, 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 and get it into you. It builds you and makes you strong. It becomes a shield that your faith will resist the doubts and the fears of the arrows the enemy fires. And so pretend that he has a helmet on, and he's got this big muscular breastplate of righteousness. He's got a belt around him, girdle of truth, and he's got these big sandals. And those sandals actually have big nails underneath to grip and to fight with. And so here he is with his defensive weapons. And in the battle of the Lord, in the battle of the good fight of faith, many of us, this is us. We're standing here and the enemy's making accusation. We're standing here and the enemy's said something to us. We're standing here and something's gone wrong and we're crumbling and and I saw in my spirit a few years back, this was what happens is that as the enemy fires, we put up our shield. We put our shield up and we're holding up the shield and we're ducking behind the shield. It's like that. And we keep fighting. We keep standing. The Bible says, keep standing. Hold the shield of faith. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. And we do it year in, year out. Year in, year out. You've been on this, you've been year in, year out. But over time, you can go down on your knees. Over time, what sometimes happens is we, are, we just get weary. The Bible says, do not grow weary doing good. And the shield of faith is like that. And we, Amy, Amy, Amy. And we're tired. And we just want to quit. And we just have no hope for that thing we've been praying for. No belief anymore, hope for the thing that we were believing for. And even some of us got to the point and said, where are you, God? But we have forgotten something. We weren't just given this shield, or this helmet, or the breastplate. We were given one other thing, and it's called the sword of the Spirit. And I want to show you how this, you're left handed, aren't you? You're going to go right. He picks up his sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is the right, it says, the word of God. It's what we call the rhema word. It's the word that you get for that battle, that promise, that prophecy, that scripture you got when you started ministry or when you believe for your family, that my family will be saved. And you used to have that and it's gone. And it's in the back of your Bible. And the Bible says that we are to wield the sword of the Spirit. Start throwing your sword back. Start going to war. And hold up, not me, tack them, okay. <laughs> and come on, yeah, come on, come on, let's get excited here. And so as he gets up, he wields the sword of the Spirit. He aims that promise, that prophecy, and he declares to the enemy, this is the truth that I have received from God. And he fights back with the promise that God gave him. You can sit down, you are brilliant. Well done. I hope you saw something tonight. Sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the rhema word. You know what? It may be a dream, a revelation, a prophecy, a promise. 
It could be a specific verse. You know, I have one whenever that I use, and one of them is that uh, Ephesians 2.10, I'm his workmanship. I am God's bit of clay, which he's created to do good things in Christ Jesus that he's preparing in advance. That's one of my swords. I pull that sword out and I start to it. 1 Timothy 1.18 says this, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies, those rhema words, those now words I t- you previously made concerning you, that you, by them you may wage the good warfare. You take up that rhema word and you start to aim it at the enemy. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? He was weary. He was weak as 40 days of fasting, living off water, and the enemy saw an opportunity. I'm going to come after Jesus. If I can make him fail, then he cannot go to the cross as a clean lamb. And so he came and tempted it. And what was the response of Jesus? Jesus didn't just stand there and take it. He didn't hold up his shield and just say, Okay, say whatever you want. I'm just holding my shield. Jesus actually picked up a sword and he said, answered, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan then came to him again and Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then Satan came again and he said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What did he do? He grabbed the word of God and he started to pray it. He grabbed the word of God and he started to praise it. He grabbed the word of God and he started to fight back against every thought that was being bombarded his mind, against every attempt that was against his family. He started to fight against his destiny being taken from him. He started to fight for his future. He refused to just sit and allow the devil to throw more darts. You can scream and shout, but it's the word of God that's going to make make the difference. So I'm encouraging you tonight, but I'm also equipping you that you have something to go with. You need to be in the Word to get the Word. You need to be in the Word to wield the Word. You can't wield that sword if you don't know the Word. I have every prophecy that's ever been spoken over my life. We write them out, we discuss them, we talk and we pray over them. We don't ignore them. If God has given the privilege to give me a Word, then it it is only the right thing to do is take it and hold it precious. And so I use that to pray and to speak. And so I speak using the words and the prophecies and the scriptures. And as the band can come back at this time, the end of Ephesians 6, 8, and it said, and pray in the spirit on all occasions of all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. After saying, take up your sword of the spirit, his next words, start to pray with the sword of the Spirit, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert. Keep praying for the saints. Sing that word. Shout that word. Pray that word. Focus and persevere on that word. No matter what it costs, fight the good fight of faith. Wage the good wage or fight of faith. And not only just do it, you keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. Have you ever thought of the woman that had the issue of blood for years and years and years? And she kept pushing, looking, finding. And one day Jesus walked past and she pushed through the crowd. And that day became the day that her miracle came. And she could, the Bible says she spent all her money on trying to find doctors to fix her. And she could have said enough is enough. I've been there. I've been hanging out at that church for a long time. I've been doing whatever it is for a long time. I've, I've, I've tried, I've tried everything. And she could have just said, yeah, just blow it, gone. I'm just going to go back and just be alone. But she kept persevering with the word that was upon her life. Persevere under the truth in heaven becomes a reality on earth. Do you have a promise that God has spoken over your life? Do you have a promise for somebody close to you that you've been witnessing to? You've got Christmas coming up. You've got all of these events that you need to start praying into. But I don't just pray. Prophesy into them. Wield the sword of the Spirit. Have you ever thought about the chicken and the egg? The famous question, which comes first? 
I still don't know. Don't really care. But for the purpose of what I want to tell you, have you ever thought about that little chicken? No one thinks like this except for me. This little chicken sitting inside an egg. Its DNA is, says the way it was created, its DNA says there's a shell that needs to be broken. Inside of it, it's got the DNA that says be fruitful, multiply. I'm trying to show you an imagery here. God says to you, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. This little egg sits, this little chicken sits in there and says, all it has is, I've just got a tap. That's all it knows. One word, one word. So what does that chicken do? It taps. And all it knows is one word, tap, 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 and tap, and tap. And this little chicken is enclosed in the shell. All it knows, if I keep tapping, my future is on the other side. It doesn't know what its future. It doesn't even know that there's light. It just knows deep inside that is the direction I've got to go. I've just got to tap. And you know that you have a word inside of you. Church, I feel the Holy Ghost upon me. You have a word inside to go a direction. And God says, tap, tap, tap. Break out of the shell and watch what I'll do on the other side. If you will wield that spirit sword. That word that you have for your ministry, for your family, for your husband, for your wife. That promise for your marriage. Grab it. and Fight with it. Many years ago, my daughter at the age of 13 became a little bit of a rebel. Not too bad. So there's been some worse kids than her, that's for sure. But we discovered something that we didn't like that I read in her diary. My wife was snooping around. And we talked to her about it, but my heart was grieved. And I had a promise, and we had a promise that our children would know Jesus, that they would follow Him all the days of their lives. So I remember getting up extra early. I had this word that I am her dad, and Satan is not taking her. And so every morning for months, I would pray and pray. No one, I'd just speak the sword, spirit, truth and I'd wield it in Satan's face. I didn't say I was better than him or stronger than him. I just said, I have an authority from God over my little girl. And I'm telling you, Satan, you do not have the same authority. And so in the name of Jesus, you take your hands off her. Her whole attitude changed. Rebellion went as we loved and we did things in the practical. As we fought for her, do you know what? She was great. A few years later, in fact, she's been to this church and some of you may have met her. She left home to move, to go to university. And the devil saw another opportune time. So he went after again and she went off the rails chasing what she had never had in the church. And so he started to pray again. Devil. Grandma started praying. Grandpa started praying. Mum and dad started praying. You will not have this girl. You will not have her. And we prayed and we prayed. Today... She's a wonderful woman of God, serving her church in Perth, doing great things, bought her own house. She still needs a good husband, but you better be rich if you want to go out with her. No, no, I'm not into it. But what happened? The same without you. I have a son. We grabbed the sword of the Spirit. We didn't just say you can have him, devil. You're going to have to go over my dead body if you want to have my children. I'm sharing that today. There was a lot more going on, but that was the starting point for us to see things turn around. And so I'm speaking to all. All of you have a fight on your hands. It's time. And some of you have been sitting back and going, it feels like the enemy is just smacking me. I feel like my shield of faith is starting to split. Well, God said, I gave you a sword. You don't have to take it anymore. You can start whacking back. You can start stabbing back. But you need to stab not your stuff. Don't fight don't fight with your emotion because that's like fighting with a big piece of spaghetti, a noodle. Have you ever tried to wield or throw a noodle around against the enemy? Flip, flop, flap. It doesn't work. I've only got a noodle inside of me. And that noodle isn't strong enough for Satan, but I have the authority of Jesus Christ and his word, which is my sword. And that is stronger than anything Satan can bring against me. 
So this evening, I leave you encouraged, but you're also equipped on how to fight the good fight before you. And that how you can pray in this season coming up over your loved ones. I watched my grandma at the age of 90 become a Christian after she told me never, ever, ever invite me to church ever again. I will never go to church ever again in my face at church. But God said, she will be saved. So every day we wielded that sword. You promise she will be saved. At the age of 90, lying in bed, we introduced her to Jesus Christ. It's never too late. Never, ever quit fighting for those you love. For those God has put in your pathway. For that promise that has been upon your life and hasn't come to pass. Kings never stop going to war. Kings never hand off for somebody else to fight for me. Kings never make alliances or compromises with the enemy. Kings stand their ground, stand their ground, and they fight the sword of the Spirit. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, first step in the fight for the promise and the fight for your authority and the fight for your family is to submit to the one who gives you the power and the authority. And this evening to do that, we need to become a follower of Jesus Christ. We need to be born again, born of the Spirit, repent of where we were going and receive the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And that's the starting point before we can go any further. Before we can start to pray and wield the Spirit, before we can wear the armor of God and wield the shield of faith, we need to first make a decision to follow Him. And tonight in this room, there'll be a number of people. Some may never know Jesus, have known Him. Some may have and have walked away. You know who you are. And some here are not sure. Maybe you're younger and you're raised in the church. Maybe you just come from some other church. I don't know you. But you're not sure that you are born again, a child of God. And God will be pushing on your heart right now to say, come follow me. If that is you, and I'm not going to take much longer, but if that is you tonight, and God is saying, come follow me. I need you. I want you. He's saying that to everyone. That is you. Will you respond so we can pray together as a church? If that you, just raise your hand and I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Others will look after you afterwards. I'll see your hand raised. But right now, if you are not a follower of Jesus, you need to become a follower of Jesus. Anybody? Anybody in this room? Across this room? Let's all stand, shall we? Father, I pray across this room right now, Holy Spirit, that you are bringing to memory promises, prophecies, words, Scripture for situations that have been going too long and are starting to wear out people. Tonight we choose to grab that and we are going to wield it in prayer and we're going to wield it in that promise. That what, the, what man intended for evil, God has intended for good. Father, we pray that you will stir up that word right now. And as we praise and worship you for the next few minutes, that we are going to wield that spirit and we a sword and we're going to see the situation and we're going to speak back to that circumstance, to that demonic force. And we're going to say, in the name of Jesus, my God rules. Every chain be broken, blind eye open, the oppressed set free, good news, healing of the mind in Jesus' name. And maybe you have somebody that you have just said it's too hard, but now God's stirring up. They need to be born again. You're going to pray for them again and again and again. 
in Jesus' name. And he had the band that they would play. And I want you just to wield and to stand and worship God. And as you're worshiping, wield that worship as a weapon against the enemy. Thanks, guys. And if you'd like somebody to stand during this time to, with you, and you come forward or you need to operate, you need to step out by faith, come forward and join the worship and we'll pray with you, we'll stand with you. Where two agree on earth, so shall it be on earth as it is in heaven. So have someone come and stand with you for that promise.